to one. Matthew chapter two. We start reading from verse one. Um, I hope you are there. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Amen. Let's pause right there. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is what the wise men said. We don't know exactly how many the wise men are. They gave three gifts, so oftentimes uh, it is assumed that they were three, but not necessarily. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the Bible says these wise men came from the east, and they came to Jerusalem. And they went straight to the palace, to the king's palace, King Herod. And they said to him, where is he who has been born king of the Jew? The wise men recognized that whoever had been born was king. That they just recognized that. And so when they got to the palace, they were asking for the king. Now, imagine going to the king's palace and you're asking for another king. But that's what they did. So for them to go there to Herod, knowing fully well that this is the king's palace, and they were asking for another king, that means they were doubly sure. And so we see right here that Jesus... Even at his birth, was recognized by Gentiles as king. Now, Isaiah prophesied about this king 700 years before he was born. In fact, the scriptures has so many prophecies about Jesus who was going to come to the world as king. Let's look at one of those prophecies, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7. This is a passage I'm sure you have heard before many times. But it is about the prophecy of Jesus seven centuries before he was born. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward. Even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This was Isaiah talking about Jesus. And he called him, a child is born, a son is given, but he's going to be a ruler. The government will be on his shoulders. And of the increase of his government and of the peace that will come in his government, there will be no end. It is an eternal kingship. Jesus is the king. He didn't become king when he was born. He had been prophesied as the king to come. We serve the king of the Jews and king of the world. Now, if you think 700 years is a long time, how about this? How about 1,400 years before Jesus was born? There was another man who talked about him. Is that man, that prophet, Balaam. That prophet that was greedy. Anybody know his story? Way back in the book of Numbers. Look at what he said about King Jesus. Turn your scripture to Numbers chapter 24, verse 16. 
Numbers chapter 24, verse 16 and 17. The utterance of him, you could look at it on the screen just to um, save time. The utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with his eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. And batter the brow of Moab. And destroy all the sons of Tumult. That was the King Jesus. This prophet, Balaam, was speaking about 1400 years B.C. I see him. What did the wise men see? What did Balaam see? Ah. The Jesus we serve is unlike anybody else. He's a king whose star had been revealed 1,400 years to this prophet. He said, I see him, but it's not now. What I see is going to come long time from now. I see him, he's not near, but he's a star. And a scepter, scepter that is the, 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 the mantle or the symbol of authority in the hand of a king. And when the wise men came, they said the star we saw is the star of a king. Jesus is the king of the whole universe. You are lost if he's not the king in your life. Now, I want you to notice this. They've seen him. They've prophesied about him in, in words. But you know what? Isaiah actually saw the vision of him on the throne. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Look at this. Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read from the from beginning of that chapter, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, starting from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, uh, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Guess who Isaiah saw? King Jesus on the throne. Is Jesus king in our lives? Or is he just like a friend that is kind of, we just accommodate him in our life and, you know, we, we call his name when we need him. We, you know, we hear some of the principles he has to offer. That's not who Jesus is. He is the king, the eternal king. But I want to tell you that he's not only the king that has been revealed many, many centuries before he was born. He's the soon coming king. Look at what John the Revelator sees about this same Jesus in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to read for now just verse 16, but we're coming back to read from 11. Just for the moment, Revelation 19 verse 16. Look at what John the Revelator saw. And he has on his robe and on his tie a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is Jesus the one that was born in a manger. You have to know that there is no question about the kingship of Jesus. And the reason why nobody can serve God half-hearted, the reason why nobody can have Jesus in his life just as a religious ruler is that the king takes nothing less than absolute worship. There are many people that they have, they know the other parts of Jesus. Oh, he's a lovely friend. He's a warm friend. He's all, that, he's all of that. But until he has the absolute rule in our life, we don't know the Jesus of the Bible. Because he is the king. And he has to be the ruler of our lives. 
Now, let's proceed in that story. His coming was met with trouble and hostility. You, it may surprise you. <laughs> His coming was met with trouble and hostility. Herod was troubled. His palace was troubled. R read verse 2. When they came and said, where is the king born, uh, the, uh, the, the child born, king of Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. He was perplexed. And all Jerusalem with him. Wow. The wise men, the nobles of the land of Jerusalem, they were perplexed when they heard that a king had been born. Now, this has also been prophesied that this is going, to, this is exactly what will happen when Jesus will come. Look at it, Psalm 2. This is a psalm that is common to us. A lot of us read it, but it's a messianic psalm. It is not really about David, it's about the ultimate David, Jesus. Psalm 2. Let's read from verse 1 to 7. All right. Do we have it on the screen? Psalm 2, verse 1 to 7. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Against who? The Lord. And against his anointed. That is Jesus. Saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. And he who sits in heaven shall laugh. That's God the Father. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his displeasure. Saying, verse 6, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. David said, what I saw is that when this king was going to be born, the nations will be in rage. The kings of the earth, they will gather themselves together. There will be agitation. And David was asking, why? Even though David was re ex experiencing that in his life. But you know, David was not just a king, he was a prophet. He prophesied so much about what was going to happen to Jesus. And the Bible says, as soon as the wise men came and said, where is the king? Herod lost his mind. All his scribes and the chief priests and the Pharisee, everybody. The Bible says the whole Jer of Jerusalem. That means all, the, all these big men that knew about this in the palace. All of them, the aristocrats, are troubled. God said it before it happened. One more passage on this. The king came into the midst of his enemies. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Let's read it. Verse 1 to 2. Everything about Jesus had been prophesied. Even his enmity. Are you there? Psalm 110, verse 1 to 2. The Lord said to my Lord. Now, look up on the screen. Do you see a difference between that Lord, the first Lord, and the second one? What is the difference? Okay. It's not a typo. It's exactly written like that. The first Lord, L-O-R-D, is the translation of the word Yahweh, the Hebrew word for God, the Father. And Yahweh just means I am. That's the proper name of God the Father. The second Lord there is the word Adonai, my Lord or Master. So Yahweh the Father said to the Lord Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Father says, you are going to come, but you are coming right into the midst of the enemies. One of them is represented by Herod. But the father says, sit as king on my right hand. And you're going to remain king until I bring all your enemies as your footstool. So when Jesus came, the whole place was troubled. Now, let, let me uh, share other things that support this. What happened when Jesus was born, according to the Gospel of Luke? This is Matthew. 
You have to recognize that by this time that wise men came, Jesus was probably about two years old. So uh, what we are reading now is a young child, not a baby. How do we know? By the time Herod will inquire about what time was the child born, they gave him an estimate, ah, maybe about two years, so he killed all the two years uh, and younger. Right? We'll see that. So Jesus was a child there. Yeah. But what happened the very first day that Jesus was born? As a newborn. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to read verse 6 to 7. You know this. I just want to bring it out. Luke chapter 2 verse 6 to 7. So it was while they were there, that is the parents of Jesus, the days were completed for her to be delivered and she brought forth her first son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because what? There was no room for them in the inn. How many of you have given birth, how many of you women here, you gave back to your child in the feeding trough where you, they feed sheep? He said, this is where I'm going to have my labor and bring back my, my child. That's where Jesus was born. The Bible says the parents went back home for census that was mandated by Caesar Augustus. So they went back to Bethlehem, the place of their origin. And while they were there, her days was completed for her to give birth. And there was no room in the inn, in the hotel, in the motels, in the lodging area. Where did she have to go and give birth? She went to the, the feeding trough of animals. At least nobody will occupy that place except animals. And she gave birth to the Lord Jesus there. What is this signifying? God was saying that not only would the elites and the rulers and the kings be troubled and hate him, even the general world will have no space for him. Are you following? And that's what happened on the day Jesus was born. The king of the whole universe born where and in fact, the angels told the shepherds, this is going to be a sign. You want to know the child I'm talking about back in the book of Luke chapter 2? When you find a child in the animal trough, that is the child. Why? Because it's uncommon. The only baby that was in the animal trough in the whole place that time was Jesus. When you find there, then you know that is the king. You say, Pastor, why are you telling us this? The reason I'm telling you this is that if you have wondered... You need not wonder anymore. Why is it that the government of this world, the elites of this world, the powerful of this world, the scientists of this world, the intellectuals of this world are hostile against Jesus? It has been written so. It was exactly the same reason why Herod said, where is he? He said, I'm going to worship him, right? But is that what he intended? Oh, <laughs> he was looking for him. You will see later on when the angel says, take that child because Herod is seeking his life. I want you to know that it had been written that it will be so. So when we look around our world today and you see the social media hatred for Jesus, you see even the world of education, the colleges and the universities, their hostility against anything called Christian or Christ. It had been written so. The world will hate the king and they will not want to have anything to do with him. The government will not have anything to do with him. The ones that are high and mighty will have nothing to do with him. Even the world will have nothing to do with him. So, he will be hated even though he's the king. Now, the question is why? Why is it that if Jesus is the creator of the world and he is, the Bible says, for him, by him and through him and for him were all things created, why should he be hated by the world he created? Think about this. Can you imagine wanting to go into your own house that you are paying for and somebody says there is no room? There are at least three reasons why there was this trouble and commotion and hatred and it still exists today. Number one is this. Because before Jesus came, in the flesh, which is what we are reading, there was already a ruler of the world. Satan. That is why. 
And you know that two drivers cannot really conveniently drive one car. Before King Jesus came, there was already a ruler of the world. And it is Satan. I want you to imagine this. I'm going to show you the scriptures that back this up. Imagine being on your job. You are a supervisor. You've been in that position for 15 years. You've actually customized everything, how the, the affairs of the office is run. You know everybody. You've helped to even shape all the procedures and everything. And you just get a letter from the higher up one day, and they tell you, they give you a name of a person that is coming to replace you. Not because you have been promoted. They just say, well, we have a replacement for you. And the person is coming to take your office, take your everything, and you are going to be kicked out. In fact, not only that, it's going to change all the procedures you've put in place. It's going to do everything his own way. How would you feel? You'd be like, wow, I can't wait to meet this guy. I'm just happy that somebody is coming to take over from me. And I'm going to be bumped out. That is why there is hatred for Jesus. Because, as you will see, the Bible says... Satan is the ruler of this world. And when you read further, God said, I'm sending a ruler to the world. And Satan says, ah, really? Okay. It's not going to be easy. Look at a few scriptures. John chapter 14, verse 30. John chapter 14, verse 30. This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus calls Satan himself the ruler of this world. All right? John 14, 30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me. Jesus speaking of his crucifixion. He told his disciples, the ruler of this world, before I came, is coming. Referring to Satan. Chapter 12, verse 30, 31. We're going somewhere with this. John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So, what you would feel if you were to get that letter is what Satan felt. And so, what happens is that the Bible says the whole world is under the sway of Satan. When the new king was born, the kings of the earth that are the children of the devil, they raised alarm. And that's why Herod said, find him, get him, I'm killing him. So why do you think the governments of the world hate Jesus and Christianity? They are perplexed when you mention the name of Jesus. Because they are of the other ruler of the world. Why is it that the scientists are hostile to the faith in Jesus they don't want to hear it because known to them or unknown to some of them, they are under the sway of the ruler of this world, who is Satan. Why is Hollywood and the social media and the news media and all these institutions, the rich and the powerful and the elite of this world, are disturbed and troubled when you start talking about Jesus? This is exactly the same reason. Because inside of them, ruling them, is the ruler of this world. And because of that, the name of Christ, this other king that has been prophesied before this time, that name offends them because their father has poisoned their heart and their mind against Christ. And it's not going to change. Do you know that the scripture actually says the whole world is under the sway of Satan? Do you know the Bible says that? Let me show it to you. Because some of us might say, well, really? You mean all those people like that? They really, really just hate Jesus because Satan is in them? Let me show it to you. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Look at what it says. Now, this is the epistle, not the gospel of John. We know that we are of God. If you are a believer, you are of God. And the, what does he say? Um, what part of the world? The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 
So when Herod hated Jesus and he was angry that this other king was born, it was not just Herod. He was the one ruling Herod. Because the kingdoms of this world are under the kingdom of Satan. He's the one that moved Herod and said, find the child and kill him. Because I am the ruler here, he's not coming to take rule over here. What does this tell you? Then you should not be surprised by the hostility against Christ and Christianity in this world. Because it had been said, rule thou in the midst of your enemies. A lot of times we believers, we are saying, well, why do people don't, not want to listen to Jesus? That's why. Because the one under whom they are moves their heart to have hatred against Jesus. You should not be surprised at all why, even why the devil is against you when you are a child of God. You say, well, how much hostility from Satan just because I gave my life to Christ? The reason is that when you give your life to Christ, you are coming from under his rulership and you are joining yourself to the rulership of another king. Then the old king says, no, I'm going to fight you. I'm going to fight you. John 15, verse 18 to 20. Look at what uh, Jesus says. John 15, verse 18 to 20. If the world hates you, you know that he hated me before it hated you. That's what Jesus says. If the world hates you as a child of God, you know that the world first hates me before he hates you. Don't be surprised. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep your word. Why are Christians being imprisoned in China? Why are some of them being killed silently? This is the reason. Because the king of the world, the king of the government says, kill them all because they belong to the other king. Why is Boko Haram cutting people's head? That is why. From the day the king stepped into the world, there was hostility. You and I are living in a world that is ruled by Satan. Now, you say, well, but Jesus is the king of the world, right? Because he's the king of kings. Pastor, you just read, he's the king of kings. Yeah, it is. But here is what it is. Remember Psalm 110. Sit thou at my right hand until there is coming a time the king we are talking about will crush all the hostility with the king of that world, Satan. But the time is not yet. And that is why when Herod now said, you know the story, go back there. Then uh, verse 7, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the, the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for this young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. But we know he was lying, right? I will skip some verses because that's not my focus. Now, I'm going to go ahead. I will come back to that later. The Bible now says in verse 12, Then being divinely warned in a dream, that is the wise men, that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. They didn't come back to tell Herod where they found the child. Right? And so what happened? Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The father of Jesus saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt. And stay there until I bring you what? For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. The king of the heart of the earth was angry against the king of kings for coming to their territory. Verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, departed for Egypt. Imagine carrying this ba- a baby by night and fled. And the baby that was being carried, mind you, is God in the flesh. 
And it was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I call my son. Now, pay attention to this. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its district from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. He massacred thousands of babies just in a bid, perhaps, to get Jesus. He must be one of them. Now, how does this concern us? This is how it concerns us. If the world is too comfortable with you as a child of God, it's probably because they are not seeing your allegiance to this king of kings. If they see they ought to hate you. <laughs> if the system of the world loves you, if the unbelievers around you love you, if they are not disturbed by your life, if they are not disturbed by your words, if they are not disturbed by your values, if you are comfortable around unbelievers and they are comfortable around you, you are to be concerned. Because Jesus said, look at what happened to me when I came. The other king reacted. And he now said, where I showed you, if they hate me from birth, they will hate you. Because you don't belong to them. If you belong to them, they will love you. Children of God, if the world loves you and you claim to be a Christian, there is something wrong. Because the world only ought to love you if you are of the world. In fact, what, the, what God is telling us is that, look, as a child of God, if you, are, uh, if you are loyal to the king of kings, you must be getting some heat for it. On your job, you must get some heat for it. Except you are compromising. Or number two, except you are keeping your mouth shut so nobody knows what camp you belong to. But if you are opening your mouth, if you are standing for the king, you ought to be troubling some people. We believers ought to disturb some people. The moment we are not disturbing anybody, Jesus says, you are not following me. Because if you are following me, what happened to me ought to happen to you. Because there are two kings. Until the other one crushes the king of this world. So in our lives, is our life giving the devil a headache? If it's not, we need to go change some things. We are probably not living fully as a child of this king kingdom. You know, churches that don't give anybody a headache about sin, is because they look a lot like the world. And that's why all kinds of things can happen there, and it's just fine. You know, as I studied this, it actually really, really also bothered me. If everything I say is acceptable, you that you're on social media, if everything you put on social media, nobody criticizes it, uh, something is wrong. Because the king we are following, there was no room for him in the inn. And the rich and powerful didn't want him. In fact, they wanted him killed. Number two. Not only if there is no hatred or hostility, but if there is always room. Room to accept the values that you have. You're not following this king. Because when this king came, they said, the inn is full. The inn is full. Your family value is not permitted here. Your morality value, there's no room here. You can do it outside where nobody cares, but we don't want it here. That has not changed. May I put it this way? 
If you are looking at some believers that are being criticized or persecuted as strange, you are the one that is strange. Did you hear that? When you see on your news, you say, well, some, some believers in some part of the world, they have been criticized. And then maybe in America, they have been criticized. You say, well, what kind of believers are these? I mean, you, do you have to leave out all your Christianity for everybody to see? I think you guys, you are not smart. You are the one that is strange. Because the master himself said, if they hate me, know for sure they wait you, except you are not following me. Our life ought to discomfort the world if we are following this king. Our speech ought to be in a misalignment with the world if we are following this king. I put it this way around. Anytime you see yourself agreeing with whoever is not on the Lord's side, the problem is with you, not with them. We're not talking, God is not saying go and pick fight with everybody. But when your value system puts you on the side of somebody that is clearly against God, God said, check yourself. It can never be. For the scripture says, what agreement has light with darkness? There is none. If you run your family with the system, the value system of the unbelievers, the king says, you, are, you cannot be in two camps. You are not in my camp. They are different. So, what the word of God is challenging us today is, have we recognized Jesus as the king? If you have recognized him as the king, are we in his camp? If we are in his camp, are we separated from the world? Because he said, I have called you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If we are still living with one leg here and one leg there, we don't have a king. If Satan is too comfortable with you, you are in trouble. It ought not to be. It ought not to be. I want to tell you as a child of God too, if, you are, if sometimes you are going through serious persecution by the devil and you say, God, what did I do? God says, because the other ruler is fighting you. That's why. Sometimes it's not necessarily what you have done. Let me ask you, what, is, what has this baby done? Nothing. What did the parents do? Is it a crime to give birth to a child? They ran at night and then after a while, the angel said, take the child now and go back. And when he was coming back, if you go and read the book of Luke, he heard that the son of Herod had replaced his father. He said, no, I'm not going back there. And then he went and dwelt in Galilee. The reason Jesus grew up in Galilee was because when the parent was bringing him back, they recognized that Herod had died, but his son, is, they said, is still enemy territory. That's why they went to live in Galilee. They are not originally from Galilee. <laughs> are you understanding so sometimes the other side of this I want you to get is this. If you are a child of God, if you are a true child of God, sometimes the devil can give you what is close to hell experience. And you say, God, this is not fair. God says, child, it's because the ruler of this world is mad with you. <laughs> it's mad at you. But I have a good news for you as I wrap this up. There is still more. I told you there are at least three reasons why Jesus was hated. This is just one. Because of the ruler of this world. Here is the good news. Eventually, this king, remember I said it was prophesied and he's still the soon coming king. When he now comes, the first time he came as a baby, when he's coming as the king of kings, he's going to crush every kingdom. And so, when you now see him coming in Revelation, he was, he's coming on a white horse for war. And the Bible says, and all the kingdoms of the world will gather against him, literally, this is not spiritually, physically. And he will crush every government and every power. The first time he ran for Herod, the second time, he would demolish every kingdom and reign as king of kings. Then it will matter whose camp you have been all along. 
Let's look at some scriptures. All right. So let's go back to that um, Psalm 110. Remember we read just two verses. Now let's read further about this King Jesus. Psalm 110. So we're going to pick, um, I might just read it from the beginning so you can get the context a little bit. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If you know the Bible, where is Jesus right now? Right hand of the Father. That's what the scripture says. When he ascended, he went. And what is he doing there, by the way? If you know your Bible, making intercession for the saints. But watch this. Read on. Sit there till I make all your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Anytime you read about rod, there is trouble coming. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteer in the days of your power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb uh, of the morning. Now, go back to Revelation. Let's now read verse 19. Remember we skip verse 19? Now, we skip verse 11 to 15. See what will happen now when he comes. When he leaves the right hand of the Father and comes down. I'd like us all to read this together. Verse 11. Okay, very good. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and he makes what? <laughs> See, the Jesus we're talking about when he's coming. Everybody talking about the second coming, second coming. Sometimes we don't even know what he's coming to do. He's coming to make war. The next verse. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. That's where you see it. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Whose blood? Not his blood this time. The blood of his enemies. And his name is called the Word of God. Uh, if you know the Bible, who is the Word of God? That is the same Jesus. This is what is going to happen at the second coming. The next verse. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. That is you, if you have gone to be with him. If you are in the right camp now. White and clean followed him on white horses. Uh -huh. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. That, uh, that with it he will strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Next verse. And he has on his robe and on his tie a name written, King. No, no I think you skipped. Okay. All right. Okay, keep going. Next verse. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. No, something is wrong with that verse. Go back. The name that is written is King of Kings. Okay, so I will not let the screen uh, put me off. And he has on his robe and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is it when Jesus is coming back. So you know what? All the institutions of this world right now that they say, carry your Jesus out of here. There is a day of reckoning for them by the king of kings. All the institutions that say we don't want Bible here, it has been since the day of Herod. All the workplaces that say well, you can't pray here, this is not a church. It has been since the day of Herod. Everything thing that you see now, you say, well, where is the rulership of Jesus if he's the king of the world? Now you understand, sit at my right hand until there's coming a time. But here is one thing as we begin to wrap this up. The world will get more difficult, more agitated and hostile against you if you're a believer. Know it. I wish it's not true, but that is the truth. But then you will need to stand with Christ. Because when the king shall pierce the heavens open and come, it's either you are with, you are with him coming with, with him as a saint and an army, or you are the one is coming against one of the two. 
You know, as a pastor, I cannot be. How can I be the one for come? Because there are only two kingdoms. That's it. There is no intermediary. There is no, well, I'm just like a, a cool Christian. I'm somewhere in between. No, Jesus says, I, I only know the people, the saints that are coming with me and the ones I'm coming against. Here is another problem. Neither of the king, I don't even know how I can call Satan king, but well, for now he's the ruler of the world. Neither the Lord or him allows one that is half-hearted. That's the problem with Satan too. He will not take you if you really mean to stand on the side of God. He says you are my enemy. Are you understanding? So it's time to take your stand for the king of kings. Leave the values of the world alone because they are the values of the other ruler. Listen, the angel told the wise men, don't go back to Herod. These were Gentiles. They are not Jews. That is exactly what God tells everyone that knows him. He said, now you have seen the king, right? Don't go back to that king. Go back home. And they said, yes, sir. They went home. When you are a child of God, God tells you, don't go back to that other king. Don't take anything from him. Because he cannot be in two camps. Jesus is the king. Anything in your life that he says, son, I don't want that, drop it. Anything that he says, this is what I want, do it. Because one day, he's coming as the king of kings. And you know what we hear about the rapture? The rapture is going to take place as soon as he pierces the Sky open, Matthew chapter 24. He said he will send his angel. The last trumpet will be blown. And all his people from everywhere in the world will be gathered to meet with him in the sky. And they will come down with him and there will be the battle. Here, it's not spiritual, it's physical. So, I want to wrap up by saying, children of God, we are saints of the Lord. But we remain constantly in a battle of two kingdoms. And I'm going to say this too, I wrap up. Don't be discouraged if you belong to the king and the ruler of this world is giving you a fit. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Oh, if you go read Luke, the angel told the mother of Jesus, he said, no, not the angel, Simeon, the, the, the man of God, when he was blessing the baby, he said, and yes, you too, a sword will pierce through your heart. Who was he talking to? The mother. The favorite. He said, this child is graced for the fall and the rising of many. That's who Jesus is. Many will stumble at him, and many are stumbling at him. And many will be raised to life through him. And he looks at the woman. Woman, you are going to cry too, because they're going to kill this son. And Mary did. If you are a child of God, and you are following God, and he appears to be some cry, God will say, well, Jesus will say, look at my mother. The reason is because the, the ruler of this world will fight you because you belong to me. Chill. I got it in control. Secondly, if you're kind of dilly darling, you don't know which camp you really belong, you need to make up your mind. There are only two rulers. The king of kings and the one that is temporarily ruling. In the end, it's not the time to switch vote. You can't. You can't. So now, decide that, look, my allegiance is for the king of kings. If you hate me, I have been told that that is what is supposed to happen. If I don't agree with everybody's value on the internet, that is exactly what is supposed to happen. That's exactly what is supposed to happen. We preachers, we are supposed to preach the word. If everybody hates it, Jesus says, well, that's what is. Remember when I preach, everybody left, and I told you, they're going to do it to you. The moment you preach what everybody likes, you're on the other side. We need grace. We need grace. It's, it, this is not, it's not a world of melodrama. It's a world of two kingdoms. Let's rise up on our feet.